Hello, everybody. This is Joe. Thank you for coming. And there I am. And there you are. Deborah Wilson says, how does it feel to be one of the beautiful people? Are you talking to me, Deborah? <laughs> and Dolores says, hi, all. Avril says, present hi beautiful people rob says hey yoda how you doing i'm doing fine rob how are you doing okay says hi everybody deborah says how does it feel to be one of the beautiful people that eh, feels great okay says watching bernie's town hall and getting rid of racism very good i was watching that too until i had to go on <laughs> I thought he had a wonderful panel, and everybody was great. Okay, I love the ball. Rob says I'm doing good. Been very busy. Well, I'm glad to know you're doing good, Rob. Steve Devore says hi all. Hi Steve. Okay, I wanted to get started uh, tonight with uh, some news about uh, the progressive short takes that have been posted so far on my page uh, this week. I have three videos posted uh, thus far. One is called The Republicans Against uh, Democracy. I think this is a big issue. Okay. I don't know why it's not. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be a big issue. But they're plainly against the idea of democracy now. I don't think they always were, but uh, they were now. They are now. And then I have a second one on what to do about armed uh, poll watchers. Uh, I think that's an interesting topic too because we're likely to get some of those in the upcoming election. And then the third video was largely about Uh, whether Nancy Pelosi ought to take the $1.8 trillion offer from Trump. There are a lot of people out there pushing very hard uh, for her to take it, and I wanted to do a short video on it. So that's out. Okay, right now I have three other short videos that are coming up. Uh, one is oh, yes. one is about um, the private equity looting ten billion dollars from company they own. Okay, another is on why the road to a vaccine is likely to be a long one. And uh, the final one that I already have cut is about a multicolored uh, New Deal. I think that's an interesting meme, so I just did a short take okay, on that particular interesting meme. I also have another two I may do this week. I'll tell you about them once okay, I've cut them. But there's a lot going on on the short take end. So, if you 
care to watch the shortcakes, that's fine. Uh, I'm doing live streams, of course, tonight, tomorrow, Thursday, and also Saturday. So my first topic for tonight is comes from a blog post by Jason uh, Hickel. The blog post is called Degrowth and uh, MMT, a thought experiment. And he published it some time ago now on September 23rd, 2020. It was called to my attention um, um, actually by Lana Dell just yesterday and she picked it up from a tweet by Stephen Hale. So, uh, it comes highly recommended by Stephen Hale and in fact I thought it was a very good piece as well. So I'm going to go over it now and do a commentary on it. Uh, Jason starts off by saying, um, MMT is getting a lot of attention these days, thanks in large part to the excellent work of Stephanie Kelton and uh, Nathan uh, Tankus, two of the movement's most effective um, communicators. Over the past weeks, okay, a number of people inspired by their work have asked me whether there is scope for thinking about degrowth from an MMT perspective. My answer, um, but definitely, in fact, the two belong together. <coughs> so Jason then gives a bit of background, uh, summarizing his view okay, of MMT in a very short space. He points out, um, MMT may sound complicated, but in fact, it is remarkably simply simple. And he links uh, to one of uh, Stephanie's videos and saying, here is a good place to start. It points out that governments that control their own currencies are not like households. Uh, they do not have to balance their budgets, quote unquote, and crucially, they do not have to tax or borrow before they can spend. Of course, I've written quite a bit about that uh, myself in my various books and blogs. Um, in reality, they create the money they spend. And they can create... <coughs> as much of it as they want. <coughs> Excuse me a second. This is clear to anyone who has been paying attention since the global financial crisis of 2008. Countries like the U.S. and U.K. have created extraordinary amounts of money to prop up the banking system. The same thing is happening right now in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Governments are simply creating the money they need to respond. This has always been the case, of course, but right now it's happening out in the open for all to see. The notion of budget constraints uh, has been revealed as a myth. Uh, <coughs> just to comment on this, it's true that governments are simply creating the money they need to respond, at least to the governments that control um, but their currency. But one issue is, have they been creating the money they need to respond? Or have they been creating the net financial assets that they need to respond? In other words, the way governments um, have been creating money to prop up the banking system has been largely through the, the central banks uh, essentially creating new money 
and swapping it out for other financial uh, assets that have ostensibly the same value in uh, the uh, uh, oh, the same value as the money that they are giving to the banks. Uh, it's a big distinction as to whether governments are simply creating money or whether they're also creating net um, the, um, the financial assets. Okay, that's the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy. In fiscal policy, uh, where you are running a deficit, you're always also creating a net um, the financial asset. Now, uh, the money itself isn't necessarily uh, the financial assets that is uh, 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 actually created. Because if you issue bonds at the same time, okay, or accompanying it, then what's left in the system as the net uh, financial assets, at least in the United States, are new treasury securities. Okay. Now, there's always new money coming into the system. Okay, but of course, when people buy treasury securities uh, in the same volume as... Uh, the fiscal stimulus, okay, that has been issued, uh, you then um, um, have the result that uh, there's money destroyed when people pay the government uh, um, for the securities okay, that people buy. So, in terms of the money, the amount of money created um, is the same as before but the net financial asset left in the economy, the new net financial asset okay, left in the economy, okay, is the treasury security that um, has been bought. Uh, okay, so Jason then goes on and says, this is not to say that governments can create and spend money without limit. MMT economists uh, uh, recognize a number of limits but they have nothing to do with budgets or deficit or deficits. The key money is uh, um, inflation. If you spend too much money into the economy, demand gets too hot and risks driving uh, um, excess uh, um, inflation. This is a, a standard sort of statement that many people in the MMT world uh, do make. In other words, the statement that the key limit is um, um, inflation, the way I like to express it is that I like to generalize it. Okay. Okay. And my generalization is that uh, the key limit okay, to spending okay, is any and all bad results that, uh, that you might get. Uh, you can spend... Uh, but, um, um, but too much money on the wrong things. Uh, for example, by giving the money away to extremely rich people, and you might have demand get um, 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 too hot to drive okay, an excess amount of inflation. But um, if you did that, you then would have a situation where the rich are getting too rich and can use the new money they've been getting uh, to undermine the democracy, they want to undermine the political system okay, in various ways. So in other words, concentration of power is also a key limit. Okay, another key limit, if you're spending in the wrong way and on the wrong things, is um, concentration of resources in too few hands. Okay, so there are a number of very undesirable results. Inflation is not the only undesirable uh, result. Before spending, we should be looking at the whole range of possible results from our specific spending proposals. Okay. And there are lots of key limits, just as important okay, as um, um, inflation. MMT economists uh, propose 
um, Jason goes on, that we should use taxation to mitigate this risk. In MMT, the purpose of taxation is not to fund government spending. Um, governments fund spending simply by issuing currency, uh, but rather to reduce uh, excess um, demand. Crucially, taxation is also used to reduce um, inequality. You tax the rich not to fund government spending, but rather simply to remove money from people who accumulate too much. Uh, you recognize that inequality is corrosive to society and to democracy, and that we're all better off uh, without it, and if I can add, or at least without uh, too much of it because there will probably always be some of it, some inequality. I can't imagine a situation where inequality could be completely um, eliminated from an economy. Okay. <clears throat> now, this chapter leaves the impression that... Uh, the chief way that MMT economists uh, suggests uh, that we mitigate uh, the risk of inflation is to use taxation to do it. That is not what MMT economists uh, think. One of the ways of limiting um, inflation is to use taxation. That is a tool in the toolbox, but the toolbox is much broader than that. And the best reference for finding out about the toolbox is actually a piece that was written by Scott Fulweiler, Rohan Gray, and Nathan Tankus, the aforementioned Nathan Tankus complemented by Jason Hickel. So, uh, what they say, okay, in their paper is uh, actually quite a number of points, okay, I made, I'm going to um, summarize them. First, um, um, excess demand is rarely the cause of inflation. They state that. In other words, there are lots of other causes, okay, of inflation, and these are not necessarily to be addressed by taxation. There's also businesses raising profit margins, businesses passing on costs, Wall Street speculating on commodities of various kinds or houses. None are, quote, caused by the general state of demand and aren't best uh, regulated by aggregate demand. Um, um, policies, unquote. Neither are rising prices on pharmaceuticals, they say. Now they also tell us that we need lots of alternative tools to manage the pricing power of uh, the big businesses. Of course, this pricing power derives from uh, uh, because in many areas we have uh, very, very big firms, just a few. Okay, so we have an oligopoly, and uh, the oligopolists have considerable pricing power. In some areas we have what's very close to a monopoly. And then, of course, uh, those who have a monopoly okay, in a particular area have tremendous pricing power. And they mentioned that during the last um, uh, decade, and this article dates from two years ago, if I recall correctly, uh, they fought um, uh, inflation in uh, the Medicare area, the, uh, the medical care area, by legislating cuts uh, to Medicare okay, and Medicaid payments. So the general point is legislated cuts to government safety net payments constrain um, inflation. S 
So I hope you're getting the general point. Uh, they say, when MMT says that a major of taxes is to help offset uh, on, on, on demand uh, rather than generate uh, the, uh, the revenue for government, we're recognizing that taxes are a critical part of a whole suite of potential demand offsets, which also includes things like uh, tightening financial and uh, 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 also credit regulations to reduce bank lending, uh, market finance, speculation, and uh, fraud. So, they recognize the need to control fraud and the prevalence of fraud in the, the marketplace. The importance of fraud for inflation, okay, potentially. They also say that assessing the potential inflationary effect of new spending proposals also requires seriously assessing how underutilized our existing resources are. And they say this is not a matter okay, for macro uh, economists. This requires detailed expert analysis from a range of industry uh, 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 analysts not just statistical regressions on aggregate um, economic data by macro um, economists. So they're saying to analyze inflation and to control inflation, we have to go beyond the macroeconomics area. And we have to start getting into microeconomics at the industry level of analysis. What they're saying also implicitly here is that um, MMT um, um, economics is expanding beyond uh, the macroeconomics area, expanding into the microeconomics area, take, as time goes on, taking more of a systems approach okay, to economics as opposed to just a macroeconomics approach. So that's very important, too. And, uh, they also recognize that the fossil fuel, real estate, defense, and financial industries are too large, too dirty, and eat up too much of our national resources. Now, this connects up very well with Jason Hickel's concern. They must be shrunk in one way or another, thus another way to offset excessive demand pressure is to tighten environmental and other forms okay, of regulation, which would disemploy people and resources in those industries and free them up to be redeployed in green production as part of the broader economic transformation of the Green uh, New Deal. They also say, we must recognize that the Green New Deal is about creating new resources over the medium and turn, which will in turn expand green output to further accelerate the decarbonization process. And that in turn, of course, will have deflationary effects. Okay. So, They also say the Congressional Research Service, as well as other budget advisory organizations, will need to be enlarged to do the analysis necessary to find the right mix of inflation offsets that best move forward the task of decarbonizing our um, economy. So, of course, Jason Hickel is very interested in decarbonizing um, our world. That's a big part of less, okay, is more. And what the MMTers are saying are not, in order to do this, 
um, but taxation is a chief tool or the chief tool. What they're saying is that in order that uh, it will be necessary to do analysis to find the right mix of inflation offsets that best move forward the task of decarbonizing our um, economy. So, I could go on further with what they have to say, but I think I've said enough okay, to indicate that their approach to inflation, which is representative of the MMT approach to inflation, since the three authors are leading figures in the MMT movement, uh, we are talking about a very broad-ranging approach um, to inflation, which goes well beyond uh, um, simply taxation. So I wanted to uh, to make that point. And uh, to make my way back to the article by Jason Hickel. So Jason then says, all of this changes how we think about um, uh, um, uh, money. Um, MMT proposes that we should understand money as something we use rather than something we own. He's right. MMT points to the functional use okay, of money that we use money for particular purposes. That is the macro or system's importance, okay, of money. And we should be thinking of it in that way, understanding it in that way, rather than as something we own, okay, rather than as an object. Stephanie Kelton sometimes says, uh, that uh, that money is no object. There are a number of different meanings for it. Of course, she means that from the standpoint of the government, what things cost is not something to be concerned about. But she also means that money is something we use and not simply an object. Jason goes on, the government creates money spends it into the economy for all of us to use in our daily lives and mitigates the dangers of excess money or ex, uh, uh, excess accumulation by pulling some of it back out, thus keeping things in balance. And then Jason starts getting to the points. So what does all of this mean for degrowth? And here he gets to relating MMT to degrowth. Let's start by clarifying what degrowth is trying to do. Degrowth has two parts, an ecology part and a social justice part. It seeks to A, reduce uh, excess resource and uh, energy use, specifically in high income nations, in order to bring the economy back into balance with the living world, and B, to do so while at the same time reducing inequality and improving people's access to the things they need to live long, healthy, uh, uh, flourishing uh, lives. So far, degrowth scholars have developed a range of convincing and feasible policy proposals for how to accomplish this double uh, objective. And he says, I discussed the main ideas in chapter five of Less um, is More. Okay, I haven't read his book yet. It promises to be a very good book. It's well worth reading. I did check on the price. The Kindle version is $12.68. So it will not break um, uh, the bank of too many people. But we can also approach this challenge using um, MMT tools. And indeed, perhaps it is even easier to think of it uh, this way. So what he's saying there is that he discusses the main ideas of the degrowth movement in chapter five of Less is More. But here he's discussing 
how we can look at degrowth uh, from an MMT point of view using MMT tools. And he says, perhaps it's even easier to think of it using MMT tools. He says, the first step is to harness the power of the government's role as the issuer of currency to do three urgent things. One, develop a generous, high quality universal public services, not just healthcare and education, but also public transportation, uh, um, 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 also affordable housing, etc. Over and over again, the evidence is clear that universal public services, not perpetual GDP growth, are the key to a happy, healthy, and flourishing society. So what is he saying? He's saying GDP is not the indicator we want to look at. We want to look at happiness, um, health, and how people relate um, to their society and at their view okay, of the relationship of their own lives to their society and to create a happy, healthy, and flourishing society. What we need is lots and lots and lots of public services. And I entirely agree, and I think reality reflects that. Among the happiest of societies uh, is the Scandinavian nations. And the Scandinavian, uh, the, uh, Scandinavian nations are famous for having high quality and universal public services. They're not always the highest countries in the world when it comes to GDP per capita. But increasingly measures of health and happiness okay, and measures on various indicators okay, of well-being are showing that they are near the top when it comes to a sense of well-being on the part of the people who live uh, in them. Of course, Various countries are developing new uh, indices for economists to look at that go beyond GDP. They recognize okay, that GDP growth is a proxy for real growth. And if I can change the framing or the language of this, okay, just a little bit, it seems to me we do need societies that are growing, are growing economically. But they need to be societies that are growing in happiness, in health, okay, in education, growing in consumption of the universal public services that make people happy. There were three categories he mentioned. Here's two. Roll out renewable energy infrastructure to completely replace fossil fuels in a short period of time, a matter of years, not uh, 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 decades, while regenerating um, ecosystems. Thus far, we have not done this because we are told, quote, it's too expensive, unquote. And Jason says, that is a lie. The best news of the 21st century is that every single government that controls its own currency can fund a rapid transition uh, 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 to renewables without even thinking twice about the cost. And he's right, of course. Absolutely right. I've been saying this myself for years and years. So is Stephanie. So have most of the MMTers. Three, introduce a public job guarantee so that anyone who wants to work can get a job doing socially useful things that communities actually need, including working in public services 
and building renewable energy uh, infrastructure and regenerating um, um, ecosystems with a living wage at 30 hours a week. Jason here is suggesting an increase in the wage to a living wage standard while reducing the hours to 30 hours per week. He says this has the additional effect of raising wages and reducing working hours across the economy, uh, 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 effectively shifting income, shifting a net financial assets from capital um, to labor. Um, this approach reduces inequality, decommodifies key parts of the economy, and ensures that everyone has access to meaningful, well-paid work and high-quality public services. In other words, it reorganizes the economy around uh, use value rather than exchange value. The use value of something depends upon the purposes that thing fulfills. So he wants to reorganize the economy around the use value of what we produce and the use value of, of the money rather than the exchange value as calculated by the market. He's calling for us to step away from the market. And he says that that's an objective that is central to degrowth thought. So this takes care of the social justice aspect of uh, 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 degrowth. So that was category three. Squarely focusing on a key aspect Okay, of MMT, a public job guarantee, but with a few wrinkles and welcome wrinkles, I think. Okay, 30 hours a week, raising the wage so that people have a living wage at 30 hours a week. That is going to increase the happiness and the well-being of large numbers of people in our um, economy. Uh, 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 Jason goes on. Of course, all of this government spending puts money into the economy and into people's pockets, and private consumption will begin to rise. And then he says, although this is mitigated to some extent because I, as I explained in less is more, shortening the work week, reducing inequality, and expanding access to public services actually takes significant pressure off of private consumption. He says classic um, um, MMT sees this as a problem because it might cause um, excess inflationary pressures. But from the perspective of degrowth, it is a problem because it will lead to an increase in resource, okay, in energy use. Well, I have to say, I'm not sure that it will, and I'm not sure classic MMT sees this as a problem. It might see this as a problem, but I have never heard an MMT or mention the idea that uh, actually paying a living wage um, and reducing the work week would be um, inflationary. Haven't heard anybody say that. Now, maybe I missed an article somewhere. I would say that MMT as a movement is silent on that question. Uh, anyway, he says, but from the perspective of degrowth, it was a, it was a, it is a problem because it will lead to an increase in resource okay, energy use. And then he says, this is where taxation comes in. In classic MMT, you use taxation to reduce demand in order to control inflation. But we can also use taxation, he says, to reduce demand in order to bring resource and energy use down to target levels. 
And of course, we can do that in a progressive way by starting with the rich, which is important because as Thomas uh, uh, Piketty has pointed out, reducing the purchasing power of the rich is one of the single most effective climate policies we can deploy because the energy use of the rich is way out of whack. It is. So in short, the government would create money in order to expand the use value economy. In other words, he's dividing the economy into two segments now to expand the use value economy, the things that people actually need to live well, and would then use taxation to regulate the exchange value economy. In other words, reduce the size of the exchange value economy and to reduce excess private consumption in order to keep the economy in balance with the living world. So that's his idea. With this approach, the age-old question of, quote, will we have enough GDP in a degrowth uh, scenario to provide for thriving lives, unquote, becomes irrelevant. We can generate the funding for public services and the job guarantee without even a thought, okay, to GDP. He says, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but GDP becomes an irrelevant uh, indicator. Indeed, parts of the economy that are presently measured by GDP might shrink. But that's okay, because GDP is not the primary uh, but, uh, but, um, um, arbiter of uh, the provisioning. In the scenario I have described, the majority of uh, the provisioning is done directly um, by the government, I gather. So exchange value GDP might decline. That is, market values might go down. But uh, use value access to the things we need to live well improves. Now some degrowth scholars have worried about um, MMT in the past because we know that that is always a bad thing when it comes to resource and um, energy use. The thinking goes that just as debt uh, represents a claim on future labor, so too it represents a claim on future resource and uh, energy use. And because debt comes with interest and interest grows, debt generates real pressure for GDP growth, which of course has severe um, ecological um, impact. But in MMT, deficit spending is not the same as what uh, private borrowers experience as debt. Why? Because deficit spending does not, in fact, um, um, have to be paid back. Oh, well, that's right. And that's true even if the government is issuing debt, okay, at interest, which is the standard way it's done, okay, in the United States now. But I think also what Jason is overlooking here is that, okay, in MMT, you could do deficit spending by simply issuing currency and failing to, uh, to issue debt um, in the same amount as the deficit spending. You could skip the sale of the debt instruments, skip the growth okay, of interest. and just have uh, the net financial assets added um, as um, a currency or cash reserves. It's not something commonly done now because people go crazy over the idea of um, printing money, even though strictly speaking, it's no longer printing money when you issue reserves.
But uh, this can easily be done. And there's no question of national debts growing. Jason says, this breaks with how governments uh, usually think about um, deficits. We often hear that because there is a deficit, we have to do all we can to grow the economy in order to pay it down. Of course, if we don't issue the debt instruments, then our debts, uh, the public debt will no longer be growing and we won't have to pay it down. And of course, we could even issue currency Okay, or reserves in order to pay off all our debt as it falls due. And in this set of live streams, I've often, often talked about overt congressional financing, which involves uh, paying for deficits by Congress simply ordering the Federal Reserve to create cash reserves for the Treasury to deficit spend. And cash reserves for the Treasury to pay back all the public debt as it falls due. Um, um, MMT argues, says Jason, that this simply isn't true. Indeed, we might say that the deficit is just an alibi for those who seek to grow the economy for other purposes, i.e. to maximize elite accumulation. And Jason says, and he's dead right about this, the alibi is false, and we can call it out. Yes, let's call it out all the time. All of this raises a question. If the governments can create and spend money so easily, then why have they so long told us otherwise? Well, according to MMT economists, the narrative of fiscal responsibility is a ruse that's intended in large part to prevent people from demanding that governments provide job guarantees and universal public services. Uh, remember, governments are happy to create money when it comes to financing wars and pumping up um, asset values, but when it comes to paying for public services, they say it's not possible. Why would governments do such a thing, asks uh, Jason. Because if people have access to a public job guarantee doing socially useful work, and if they have access to high quality universal services, then why on earth would they ever agree to do socially unnecessary, meaningless, or degrading labor for private firms if the goal of such firms is primary to accumulate, primarily to accumulate a profit for the holders of capital? The answer is, uh, they wouldn't. And maybe that's why the wealthy seem to be opposed to the idea of a public job guarantee doing socially um, 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 useful work. Because if the work is socially useful, of value to the local community that I live in, why would I ever sign up with, let's say, health insurance companies to do marketing work for the health insurance companies? Why would I go to work for perfume companies to do sales work for perfume companies? Why would I do much of what is done in the private sector today? I mean, much of it is meaningless or degrading labor. Even when the labor itself is not actually degrading, the hierarchical relationships between bosses and workers are such that the labor in those firms becomes um, degrading. The goal of, of such firms is primary, primarily to accumulate profit uh, for the holders of capital. But if I'm not a holder of capital, why would I be interested in that? I wouldn't be interested in that. So I would not work for them. So the point is, when MMT is married to less is more, and the public services become much stronger, and the job guarantees okay, are there, and society gets more equal as time goes on, 
it will become increasingly difficult for private sector companies uh, that are dedicated to doing things that have very limited social value, it will be hard for them to get people to work for them. They will have to pay very high wages to get people to work for them. They don't like that idea at all. Jason says, and again, I think he's right. In other words, governments have to maintain an artificial scarcity of money in order to ensure a steady flow of cheap labor for private firms. As I argue, and less is more, capitalism seeks to sabotage public abundance in order to generate uh, private in order to generate uh, uh, private riches. This leaves us with an interesting point. Sorry, it was difficult to get that out. This leaves us with an interesting point. MMT proposals align um, elegantly with one of degrowth's key observations, namely that if growthism depends on the perpetual creation of artificial scarcity, then by reversing artificial scarcity, by providing public abundance, we can dismantle the growth uh, imperative. As uh, Giorgios Kallis uh, has put it, quote, capitalism cannot survive under conditions of abundance. MMT provides an opportunity for us to create a post-growth, post-capitalist um, economy. And I would modify that to say it gives us an opportunity to create a post-growth a post-growth in GDP post-capitalist uh, uh, economy okay. but that economy would be one that would be growing in happiness growing in dignity growing in um, um, equality and growing in wellness, it would be one that would be growing in all the values that really matter to uh, human beings. So, okay, on that note, I've said what I have to say about uh, Jason uh, um, uh, Pickle's ideas. Obviously, I like them very much. And obviously, I had a few critical comments that I hope uh, will be of interest and use to him if he ever sees uh, this uh, this live stream. So, now, I also wanted to talk some tonight about... the problem of fighting, okay, an electoral coup, okay. Uh, there was an article that appeared, okay, in Jacobin. I'll share it now. It was uh, actually by the well-known um, activist named Jane, but Jane McAlevey. Let me get Jane's article up. And what's interesting about this article is that it's based on her experience. Uh, her experience of an electoral coup, specifically the electoral coup, uh, that occurred in the 2000 Florida recount here in the United States. Because make, make no mistake, that was an electoral coup. The presidency was stolen from um, Al Gore by the stopping of the count um, 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 in Florida. With no good reason to stop the account. In other words, the count was stopped because the Supreme Court 
was afraid of more Brooks Brothers uh, the riots in Florida. And to stop those, they stopped uh, the county and made the choice of who would be president uh, themselves. And of course, since there was a Republican conservative majority on the Supreme Court at the time, they swung the election over to George W. Bush. And you know what that uh, cost America. Her thesis is, there's a real danger that our country could plunge head, plunge head first into a new version of Florida 2000, when Al Gore and the Democratic Party leadership handed George W. Bush the presidency by placing its faith in the courts and the legal process and by refusing to support uh, the mass mobilizations demanding that every vote be counted. Some of you who were around for the 2000 uh, election may remember that many progressives wanted at that time to go into the streets and they were waiting for the okay by Al Gore to do that. And Jane says, uh, 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 the message hit my pager at midnight. I was watching the 2000 presidential um, on, on election returns on my neighbor's TV. Um, I didn't own a TV. I hate those things. The men with the weird toupees who feed um, um, TV news um, to our nation had called Florida for Al Gore. Then for George Bush. That's when my pager went off. Quote, don't call D.C., don't call headquarters, get next plane to West Palm Beach um, Airport um, immediately. Don't call us, rent car, go to Hilton. That's what her pager said. I've never seen, I've never seen a page quite like that one, and I don't believe I ever will again. I looked at the pager, uh, then at the TV, where confounded anchors were stammering about Florida, then back at the pager. Then I put the pager down, picked up the phone, and booked the next flight to West Palm Beach. Before the sun was up, I was on my way. The place I was leaving was Stanford, Connecticut. I was running a pilot organizing project for the AFL-CIO. When you work as national staff for either the AFL-CIO or one of the member unions, you can expect to periodically get uh, pulled, quote unquote, from whatever merely urgent thing you are doing to some other thing that is actually dire. The practice can be overused by people buried in Washington offices who are convinced that everything on their desk is of utmost importance and who have forgotten how disruptive it is to real organizing of the flesh and blood uh, workers. But in this case, there wasn't anything more important um, anywhere the presidential election was on the line. The West Palm Beach Hilton was all hustle and bustle, jacked up adrenaline and frayed nerves. All the senior organizers from the AFL-CIO were converging on the place, which became the Union Command Center in the Battle for Florida. We were the special ops, people who knew how to hit the ground uh, but running, how to turn on a dime from one task to another, and how to press the pedal to the metal, and also how to wait to zig and zag in organizer shop talk. First person I saw there was Kirk Adams, head of the AFL-CIO, National Organizing uh, Department. He said, uh, uh, hey, McAlevey, no, I don't know the assignment yet. Don't talk to me. I am too busy trying to figure it out. Be ready to roll when I do, unquote. West Palm Beach County was the land of the butterfly ballot and the hanging chat. The butterfly ballots were punch card ballots with the candidates and issues displayed on both sides of a single line of numbered voting marks, um, an arrangement especially liable to misinterpretation by people with poor vision, such as the elderly. Hanging chads were tiny bits of paper that should have fallen out of the ballot when voters punched in their choice of candidate, but hadn't, leaving a trail of ambiguity that could be used to obscure the intent of the voter. 
Thousands of ballots were being discounted or contested due to this rather archaic paper voting system. Um, but, um, but, um, but later in the day, our plan took shape. Each of the senior staff would be given a team of organizers, and we would start um, knocking on doors and collecting affidavits from people who would swear under oath that they had meant to vote for Gore, but confused by the butterfly ballot had accidentally voted for Bush or Pat Buchanan. Other teams were dispatched to grocery stores, and some were sent to a candlelight um, but protest vigil. I was given a team of 12 organizers, an attorney or two, a van, and a stack of maps indicating our assigned condominium complexes, mostly inhabited by senior citizens, and we raced off to collect um, affidavits. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. Our next section is entitled, An Unexpected, Unmo uh, Unmobilized Outpouring of Rage. From the first complex we hit until we were pulled off the assignment a few days later, it was hard to find an elderly voter who hadn't screwed up the ballot or didn't want to make a sworn statement. These places were full of funny, highly educated, cranky New York Jews. I was in New Yorker myself with a partly Jewish uh, uh, type okay, of upbringing, and these people felt like home to me. I adored them, and they were really pissed off, especially the ones who thought they had accidentally voted for Buchanan. A parenthesis, the SS guard, they called him. They were Holocaust survivors and sons and daughters of Holocaust survivors. What's more, many of these folks had been union members in the Northeast before retiring. You would knock on their door, and as if they had been sitting there impatiently wondering when the union would finally show up. Soon there were long lines in the community rooms because we hadn't anticipated such an outpouring. These folks could hardly stand up. They were walkers all around, but no one was leaving until they'd all met uh, the, uh, the lawyer, told their stories, and filled in the affidavits, and they were ready to do much more than that. Affidavits, uh, lawyers, hell, these people were furious. I reported this every morning and evening at the debrief meetings for lead organizers. Quote, so when we can we actually mobilize them put these wonderful, angry senior citizens into the streets and on camera, unquote, I would ask. But we didn't do anything of the sort. Indeed, we did the candlelight vigil, which was an awful, badly organized affair, just the kind of event that makes me crazy. First, because it could have been huge, and second, because everyone who came was bored. A good recipe for how to get very motivated, angry people to stay home the next time they get a flyer. But it got worse. Big shot politicians from across the land were starting to show up, and they all came to the vigil to calm people down. It was a mind-blowing thing to watch. Were these guys idiots? Did they want to lose or what? Don't write the Titanic. I heard someone from the press mention that Jesse Jackson was coming in two days to do his own rally in March. Hmm. Why hadn't we thought of that? Then later that night, during the regular debriefing on legal updates on the recount and the next day's assignment, a higher up said, quote, Jesse Jackson is coming to do a big march. We won't be participating in it, unquote. I thought I had heard him wrong. Quote, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Unquote. Quote, the Gore campaign has made a decision. This is not the image they want. They don't want to protest. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to seem like they don't have faith in the legal system. And they definitely don't want to possibly alienate the Jews. Um, you know, it's Jackson. So we are not going to mobilize for it, unquote. While my heart was sinking, my head was exploding. The American electoral process is breaking up like the ti Titanic and we don't want to rock the boat. Quote, I'm sorry, something doesn't seem quite right here. As a person leading a field team in largely Jewish senior complexes, and frankly, as someone raised by Jews, I can tell you that we need to take people into the streets. We need to let them express their anger. The Republicans are starting to hold a, a little rallies demanding and the Democrats are not allowed to, quote, steal, unquote, the election. We need to either support this rally or do our own or both, unquote. 
I also knew to turn them out would require some resources, beginning with transportation from each condo complex. Most of these people didn't drive or didn't like to drive, which was why they lived in condos. But that also meant they were generally home when we could find them. We had an instant mobilization in waiting. We could have 30,000 people in the streets in two days. I knew the only outfit in Florida with the money, staff, and experience to make this happen was organized labor. What was on the table here was more than a rally. It was a question of what sort of power was going to be brought to bear on a defining national crisis. The Gore people not only wanted to project a nice image, they wanted to be nice. They wanted everyone to go home and hand everything over to something called, quote, the legal process, unquote. This was ridiculous because when and how and where this went to court was deeply political. Al Gore himself appeared to actually believe that he could politely demonstrate that more Floridians had voted for him than for Bush, the, quote, democratic system, unquote, would award him uh, the election. Gore was right in the sense that he had won the state. There were other Democratic Party honchos who were not so naive, but they lived in a world where you deal with these things behind closed doors. They were completely unprepared for the hypercharged political street theater exploding in Florida. You couldn't understand the difference between a narrowly conceived legal strategy and a mass mobilization direct action strategy. They thought there was no difference. That was the Democratic Party. We were organized labor. We didn't represent the candidate. We represented thousands of union workers whose votes were being stolen and millions more who would suffer if the whole damn election was stolen. We knew how to mobilize and we had the resources to do it. We had the Florida voter lists. We had the computers. We had an army of smart people on the ground who were ready to go. And we had a base of literally millions of really angry people. We could have had buses of senior citizens chasing Catherine Harris, Florida's Secretary of State, and the hatchet woman for the Bush campaign all over the state. A seniors truth commission of lovely, smart, appealing, telegenic uh, elders lined up with their walkers outside every, every single meeting Harris was in and camped outside her house at night while she slept. Quote, don't let the Republicans steal votes from your grandparents, unquote. All they needed was a top-notch lead organizer and an experienced fail team, a lawyer, a communications team. In short, exactly the big support we had on hand. They could have operated 24-7 like in a strike. Unions know how to do strikes, don't they? That moment when we could have supported the, uh, the Jesse Jackson rally and didn't, could have organized something of our own and didn't, was the turning point. The moment when the Gore campaign and their unquestioning AFL-CIO cohort snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. And by the way, it wasn't like I was a big fan of the contemporary Jesse Jackson. But Jackson could turn people out and give a good speech, the same one he'd been giving for 30 years. The fact that our choice was between joining the rally led by Jesse Jackson and not doing anything at all was beyond pathetic. Oh, well, all that was at stake was an endless war in Afghanistan, an unprovoked war on Iraq. Uh, 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 but, uh, um, 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 um. Also, American torture, warrantless wiretapping, eight years of doing nothing on global warming, not to mention a relentless class war against workers and their unions, all building up to a second great depression. No big deal. A legal dispute, not a political fight. The rally was the next day. We were prohibited from mobilizing or from showing up in any union identifiable clothing and we were discouraged from attending at all. Only 10,000 people attended, which was not the momentum we needed or could have generated. What made it even worse was that this was the biggest event 
in the entire debacle of what would always be referred to as Gore v. Bush, a legal dispute. All we were there to do was collect affidavits from lawyers. It was perhaps excusable that Gore's political team, mired in the limitations of electoral politics, would think like that. But I was with the unions, the working people who go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bosses using every tool in the shed. Strikes, pickets, boycotts, uh, uh, blockades, sit-ins, workplace actions of all kinds, expressions of international solidarity, and more. The presidential election was being stolen. General strikes have been called for less. Karl Rove and the Republicans were not nearly as um, naive. They were bringing their people into the street in an escalating series of demonstrations. They actually understood what was happening. I remember vainly pointing this out in a nightly debrief, but was reminded, as I was reminded several times a day, that Gore, quote, didn't want that um, image. Meanwhile, fucking asshole, right? Fucking asshole. Meanwhile, a legal game plan was sputtering along. He gave away the presidency. The gutless wonder. Sorry, I added that commentary. Meanwhile, a legal game plan was sputtering along. Enough affidavits and irregularities had been found to trigger what were called, quote, 1% precinct tests, unquote, in Palm Beach. And soon after, in Broward counties, uh, but uh, the elections officers would randomly pull a sample of 1% of the ballot. Teams from both of the Democratic and Republican parties would review each ballot and challenge the vote if they felt there was evidence the vote had not been counted as the voter intended. If the number of challenges crossed a certain threshold, the county would move to a full recount. When it was announced that Palm Beach County was going to a full recount, Half of the labor organizers were sent to Broward County to replicate the affidavit operation we had honed in Palm Beach, and the other half was assigned to be at the Palm Beach tables, actually recounting the votes in Palm Beach. I was among the latter. Most of my colleagues on the first uh, um, Democratic counting team felt as if they were right at the wellspring of history, but counting ballots at hand was the last thing I wanted to do. I wanted to mobilize the base. Naively for a minute, I'd actually believe that we, the national AFL-CIO, might break with the Democratic Party and run our own field option in Florida. Once I realized how ridiculous that was, that our field operation would have to operate in a vacuum of Democratic Party strategy, and that counting was where the action was. Counting, I would go. The count begins. We arrived for the first day of counting in Palm Beach to a mob of TV cameras filming a Republican rally. Angry white men, mostly, and some white women with flags and play cards that said, Gore is a sore loser and, quote, don't let them steal the election. Their plan was to be as intimidating as possible to those of us uh, walking in to begin the recount and, of course, to grab the, uh, the media headlines on their message of Gore stealing the election. It was like walking the gauntlet of Operation uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, um, uh, um, um, Operation Rescue, the violent anti-choice group that blocks entrances to family planning clinics and um, 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 harasses the women trying to get in. This was high political theater. Quote, the whole world is watching, unquote, is of course a cliche, but for us it was a true one. We worked in teams, two counters and one observer to a team, two teams to a table. Okay, the Democratic counters sat opposite uh, the Republicans with the observers can either end uh, the allegedly neutral observer would hold up a ballot which we counters were prohibited from touching. You're supposed to call out quote Gore quote unquote or Bush quote unquote or neither quote unquote. Otherwise there was absolutely no talking in the room. We had to maintain poker faces. During the breaks I tried to size up the opposition the Bush counters were overwhelmingly young white men with crew cuts. I am blue eyed and blonde, and a crowd of white people is not something that automatically gives me the creeps. But these guys did. The word that came to mind was Aryan. In my mind, I was in a world war. These were the friggin' Nazis. Our side was quite the opposite. New labor was as much a rainbow then as it is today. 
on the AFL-CIO's team, people who looked like me were a minority. We didn't get to talk until um, lunchtime. Back at the counting tables as we waited for someone to bring more ballots. Out of the blue, the arrogant Arian across from me whipped out a camera and aimed at me. Didn't say a word, just snapped uh, my photo. I'm beginning to run out of time here, so I'm going to stop uh, the recounting, okay, the whole article, and um, on, 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 I'm going to point out, in her experience of the counting, um, Al Gore uh, was winning in every stack of card ballots. Um, Al Gore was winning. The counting was turning out for Gore. Okay. Uh, a similar thing was happening in Broward County, okay, and in Miami Dade, okay, as well. Uh, she says shit was starting to fly in Florida. It was increasingly obvious that Al Gore had actually won the state, although no one was saying this, okay, in public. You knew if you were on the counting teams, okay, if you were going to the debriefs in the evening and reviewing everything that you were able to remember from every hanging shed you had examined. Uh, that day. And the Republicans clearly understood that if enough ballots were recounted in Florida, Al Gore would be president. We were about one week into counting and three weeks past the election. We just had the no one is going home for Thanksgiving meeting. Tensions were definitely rising. Okay. Uh, um, security was super tight. Uh, the counting went on. This was in 2000, she mentions, uh, when Timothy McVeigh had blown up the Oklahoma Federal Building just five years before. Um, she was rattled, but she put it out of her head and walked to her table and continued with uh, the counting. And they said, Jane, we have decided to make you one of our counters for Miami-Dade. Hey, Jane, fucking win, win it. Check out your hotel in Palm Beach. Um, get in your car. There's a room at a hotel. Uh, 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 there's a room at a Miami hotel for you. Get there tomorrow and take everything. You're not coming back to Palm Beach. You're going to Miami with me, and we're going to win, unquote. Uh, when I got to Miami that night, I felt like I was on steroids. I sat up in the hotel um, all by myself, um, knowing I needed a good night's sleep and uh, that I wasn't going to get it. <clears throat> she turned on the TV and watched the paper movie channel and um, uh, 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 also Gladiators. She says, to this day, Gladiators is the only blood and guts action movie um, I have ever seen. Uh, and then she says, uh, however, the Republicans had clearly never considered counting ballots the be all and end all their strategy. And now they launched the blitzkrieg they had actually prepared. They were staging actions across F Florida, driving the same well-honed message about the gore loser tickets stealing the election. I was spending the first day of the count as a Democratic uh, 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 floor team leader. As we returned from lunch, the Republicans suddenly launched their coup de grace. We heard loud shouting and noises outside the counting room. Then a bunch of guys rampaged in, throwing tables and chairs, making it impossible to continue. The Brooks Brothers riot. Counting was indefinitely suspended. The media could talk of nothing but the chaos in Florida. The U.S. Supreme Court stepped in, took the case out of the hands of the Florida court. The Gore people were flipping out because guess what? They hadn't planned it this way. They imagined they were involved in a civilized legal proceeding that they were going to, quote, win the case, unquote, um, 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 simply by methodically recounting the votes, that uh, the law was going to keep them out of local, away from the Supreme Court, where things didn't look so good. But, oh, wait, the Republicans have this whole direct action thing working in perfect sync with their legal action. Um, I got another call. I can't remember who it was. Quote, hey, Jane. Uh, but you get to do what you wanted to all along. We need a big rally in Miami fast because this legal thing isn't working, unquote. 
And she said, um, you can't actually make a big rally happen now. We blew it. Uh, mass mobilizations can't be turned can't be turned on and off like that. When we landed in Florida, we could have done it. Raise people's expectations that we would win, that we could win. Uh, we could have built uh, the, the momentum, the whole bit. Not now. It's too late. The right wing has the momentum. Within hours, the only coup in the history of the United States was complete. So the moral of the story is that uh, the movement moments don't last forever. It's all about uh, timing. You have to have a strategy. You have to go to the ground when it makes sense to go to the ground, when you have the support of the people. Florida in early November 2000 was just such a moment. People were willing to leave their daily grind and step into history to defend their democracy on a scale that could be massive without any exaggeration, and what a wonderful and unlikely crazy quilt of people they were. But movement moments don't last forever, and it's much easier to snuff them out than to keep them um, actually lit. Everything depends on optimism. The optimism um, 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 organizers call, quote, uh, 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 the raised expectations, unquote. And one key to keeping expectations raised is to respect the passions and desires of people who are not full-time organizers and political junkies, who have complicated and overwhelming lives they're trying to hold together, full of obligations they're putting aside for a, for a moment for the sake of a collective goal. And the Democratic Party and the AFL-CIO leadership smothered the movement moment in Florida, snuffed it right out. The state was gores to lose and the absolute determination with which the labor elite and the Democratic Party leadership crushed their own constituents' um, um, desire to express their political passions cost us the election in Florida. What's the moral of the story? For me, the moral of the story is Biden of the DNC are the Democrats, the conventional Democrats, what are they going to do when perhaps various state elections, not just the Florida state elections, but state elections in a number of states are called into question and the Republicans are going to the streets and bringing in their shock troops. What are we going to do then? Are we going to have a movement to turn things around in each of these states? Are we going to encourage our people to go into the streets? Are we going to counter them with overwhelming uh, public force and resistance? That is something we have to do to defend our democracy. That is something we must do. Will Biden support that? That's so critical. Or will he just fade away like Gore did? And if he tries to fade away, will Bernie get in there? Will National Nurses um, the United get in there? Will the Communication Workers of America get in there? Will the AFL-CIO get in there and say, not this time? No more coups. Defend our democracy. I don't know whether they've got it in them. I don't know whether they've got it in them. Jane McAlevey still has it in her. But if they don't have it in them, I think our chances of winning this election are greatly reduced. If we count on the legal system, if we count on the overwhelming count of the votes, and that's all we plan for, that's all we strategize for, it is very, very dangerous. We could lose a whole democracy. So, with that, I'm going to turn to your comments.
Okay, I'll start. Steve Wolfbrand says, Steve Dwarf says, hi all. Kay says, great minds uh, think alike, Joe. Laugh out loud. Steve Wolfbrand says, good evening, folks. This is back at 9.09. Alvaro Mano said, did you guys see Mitch starting to laugh like some simpleton? Can't go on. Amy McGrath uh, was uh, was telling him about um, himself. Yeah, I saw that. I didn't think Amy McGrath um, came off too well. At certain points, in certain of the highlights of the, of, uh, the um, uh, debate I saw, she was good in pointing out um, some facts. But in that key thing where she started talking about uh, the crisis, Instead of condemning Mitch for what he had done in no uncertain terms, strongly condemning him, not asking questions, just loudly and strongly ripping him up one side, down one side and up the other. What she did instead was almost plead with him. How could you do this? How could you do this? She came over like a damn weak sister. And at that point, I certainly thought if we had had Charlie Booker in there, we would have cut Mitch to ribbons and he could have laughed all he wanted. It would have made apparent to the people of Kentucky that this guy was an old senile asshole who needed to get out. Sorry. Steve Wolfbrand says, hi, Kay. Steve Dvor says, I'm in the hospital and hopefully going home soon, waiting for the end to come. And my prognosis is not very good. And I think I'm okay with that. Oh, Steve, I'm really sorry to hear it. Steve says, hi, Steve. And Kay and Steve Wolfbrand says, hi, Stephen. Alvaro Mena says, I have trouble finding and keeping up with the short takes, but I caught a little bit of the Pelosi on the uh, economic uh, recovery bill. Now, the short takes are all on my YouTube channel. You should be able to find them on Facebook. I mean, I posted the three uh, within the last uh, 24 hours, all three. So they shouldn't be too down the line on Facebook. Uh, but of course, they're much easier to pick up uh, you know, by going to YouTube. I posted two late last night, and I posted the third uh, in the early afternoon today, or maybe it was a late afternoon, I forgot. Alvaro says, oh, Steve, hang in there. Steve Wolfman said, tax the damned uh, the billionaires. Absolutely. Steve says, inflation isn't a problem when most of us are broke. Alvaro says, let's just hope food banks don't ever run out of food. K says corporate greed is the problem. K says our revolution has been all over the country tonight with uh, uh, get out the vote town halls. That's great. K says one in Illinois now, Steve DeVore. Steve DeVore says, uh, but, uh, but, um, uh, asks, uh, what uh, but do you mean? Uh, Romano says to regulate the sectors. K says um, our revolution online town hall Stephen DeVore. Rob Rivera says we should all be asking can we resource this program not can we afford it. Of course Alvaro Romano says but they pull out too much on the poor and middle class. Uh, what hospital am I in? Can Illinois? Is that it? Steve says North Shore Glenbrook. Now that's near Chicago isn't it? Okay says uh, no, Stephen, that's on Facebook. Uh, Alvaro says, so we can just get uh, Dr. Joe to read us the book on um, in depth. <laughs> Alvaro says, don't get that, the phrase, quote, the pursuit of happiness in the Constitution is talking about uh, 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 MMT. Okay, he says people don't get 
that the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, is talking about MMT. Now, the pursuit of happiness uh, um, 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 uh, is not in the Constitution. Okay? It's in the Declaration. The Constitution talks about life, okay, liberty, okay, and property. Because the Constitution was crafted by more conservative people uh, than the Declaration, okay, of Independence. It was crafted by the property people, in large part, whereas some of the radicals got their sentiments into the Constitution. I'm, I'm sorry, into the Declaration. Well, um, um, in particular, Thomas Jefferson was the primary author, okay, of the Declaration. Okay, uh, but at the time they wrote the Constitution, he was in France. He was the ambassador to France at that time. Steve divorce says, interesting thought. If I recall correctly, he was in France. And while we were still uh, under the Articles of Confederation, Kay says, Avril, too many people uh, don't know about it. And Steve says, Happiness, 60,000 homeless in L.A., soon to be many more. How fucking happy can we be? Drive under my bridge. Okay, it's a tent city. He says, I'm sorry, drive under um, any bridge. It's a tent city. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's why Jason Hickel is uh, uh, advocating for solving the housing crisis. Uh, that's why public housing is so important to him. Alvaro says, Steve DeVore, thank you because everything boils down to economics. Alvaro says, because of artificial scarcity and needless austerity. And Deborah Wilson says, not that hard to do. What does that say about our representatives, K and presidents? Doesn't say anything very good about them. Alvaro Mano says, I've discovered the most valuable thing one can own. The one is down and out, and it's a can opener. Steve DeVore says, the homeless problem, I think, was more a mental health problem, but that was before all this recent uh, COVID explosion. Now, I'm not sure what's going on. I don't think the homeless problem uh, was uh, was more a mental problem, okay, than anything else before. I I don't think that's true. Steve Oprah would say, you're dreaming, Doc. Uh, uh, the U.S. kicks its poor to the curb. Literally. And Kay says, sad but too true, Steve. Arvel says, um, not America. The corrupt bastards in office, and I guess because they don't get um, MMT, even though they're working right there with the Treasury and appropriations function, uh, like Rand's. Uh, yeah, Rand Paul, I mean. Uh, this reminds me of Stephanie Kelton's closing summarization in her book. Yep, if you read the summarization, okay, in my book, uh, um, dealing with uh, about trillion dollar coins, uh, you would also find the summarization in the final chapter. Okay, of that book, which is kind of like this, okay, as well. <laughs> it's something that really comes out of MMT quite easily. Kay says, um, Avril, they probably know, but don't want us to know. Steve Wolfbrand says, the country pulled five trillion out of its ass to save Wall Street, sent us twelve hundred dollars to live on for six months. Yeah, that round of $1,200 cost actually $400 billion. I'm not saying there shouldn't be more stimulus. I think there should have been four rounds of stimulus, five rounds of stimulus, six rounds of stimulus, because we could afford it at $400 billion apiece. We could have afforded to spend $2.4 trillion on that. So people could have been comfortable while they were staying home so that we could have killed the virus. Avril says, yep, they're counting on Americans being stupid and loving to keep uh, by wallowing in the bliss of ignorance. Kay says, exactly, Avril. 
I was like, how else are they going to get expendable labor to take shit jobs during the play to make profits for the markets? Steve says, it's the middle of October and it's like 90 degrees right now in L.A. Is there no global warming? Question mark. There is global warming. God forbid Americans should want fairness from their government. Alva says, here too, and the humidity is thick as chowder. It wasn't too bad here today, but it was about uh, 75 or so. Of course, in the middle of October here, it's often 75. It's not too bad in that month. Scott's getting a little more cold towards the end of November in the Washington area. Steve Wilbrandt says, um, Avril... Um, 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 Uber has a new gig for people, evicting people, I know. Alva says, then their corporate owners won't make obscene profits for pennies. Kay says, I saw that, Steve, disgusting. Alva said, yeah, um, um, it's flourishing. Alva said, why did SCOTUS suspend the census count, okay, as a golf um, asked. They suspended uh, the census account uh, because uh, the newspapers from all over the country, the mainstream media, and thank you very much, all they could talk about in Florida was the chaos. They didn't talk about how the count was going. And they did not uh, um, um, talk about uh, the likelihood that Gore was going to win that count. So that part of the story got lost. The people doing the count knew what was happening. And the Republicans knew what was happening. That's why the Republicans kind of lobbied with the, the mainstream and talked about chaos, 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 and tried to get the Supreme Court to take it over, which the Supreme Court did. Once they took it over, they stopped the counting. The Supreme Court had no mechanisms for supervising the counting itself. The, the Florida court could do that. The Supreme Court couldn't. So they just stopped the counting altogether. And they also said that their decision uh, should not be taken as a precedent. It was a one-time thing. It was a one-off thing. Okay, it was not a precedent. Well, it's good to learn, okay, that it was not a precedent because it was an electoral coup. Um, Gore did a Facebook Live a couple of days ago that was really good. He spoke with people all over the country, okay, and the world. Has he ever apologized for just giving up in the 2000 election? Steve Wolfbrand said, voting by mail is a complete shit show in California. Uh, there are many who are getting other people's ballots or not getting their own. The stories are endless. The results of this fiasco cannot be trusted. Orange man is right. Get ready for big problems. Kay says, um, um, it's about climate change. Gore says, no, Avril says Gore was against uh, TAP. TAP? Um, um, I didn't like him, but I wasn't as knowledgeable about uh, the politics back then. Oh, rap, um, not tap, uh, but, uh, but damned autocorrect. It was Tipper who didn't like rap. It was Tipper Gore who didn't like rap. Steve Wolfman says, yeah, rappers... And Steve uh, Avril says, Steve Wolfram, yeah, he and Tipper were retentive. Kay says, he's too churchy for me too, but had he got elected, we'd have a whole different economy now. A somewhat different economy. He would have been much better on the environment and the climate and trying to get through some, uh, some climate programs. But when it came to fiscal responsibility, he was just unwilling to talk about the real fiscal facts. And he knew about them because he got them explained to him by Warren Mosler, got them explained to him by the man himself. And afterwards, he said he understood it, but he said he could not talk about it. It wasn't possible to educate people about it. Gore knew about MMT. Then, when he was running for president, 
Kay says, yes, economy for the environment. Steve says, rap is an art form. It's not uh, but political. Well, because of the way okay, it arose, it was perceived to be political back then. Avramano said, but uh, they didn't want it. Uh, Tipper wanted danger labels on rock and rap records. Yeah, I know. Uh, on Frank Zappa records. She was very much against Frank Zappa, if I recall correctly. Steve Wolfman said, well, they might have been against tap dancers as well, laugh out loud. <laughs> Avril Mano says, Wisconsin hits a record number of COVID cases and deaths after Republicans try to overturn the mask uh, the mandate. Steve Wolfman said, Biden still thinks he's running for Senate they are hiding his teleprompters. Kay says, he's doing way better than I thought he could. Kay says, got to get rid of the orange idiot. Um, but um, Kyle Rittenhouse won't be charged for gun offense, Kay, in Illinois, the prosecutors say. Um, Avril Mano says. Steve Wolfbrand said, Biden's eyes are squintier than Melania trying to read that uh, teleprompter. Steve Wolfbrand said, Poor kid will be gang raped in prison. I blame his parents. Kay says, I have to try to keep that small um, uh, um, 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 SS um, I get as it's my um, only income now. Steve Wolfbrandt, no, guards and Aryans will protect him. Um, um, I'm betting uh, they're going to let him off. KKK social visit cards left at Biden supporters' homes in um, the Tennessee, uh, says, uh, says News Week. Steve Divorce says, it wasn't for my Social Security disability check. Okay, I don't know what I do. Kay says, um, and me too, Stephen. Steve Wolfman says, Stephen, if you need money, start a GoFundMe. I'd be happy to help. You have many supporters. Stephen Divorce says, I'm not bragging, but I probably get a lot more than you do. And I don't think it's right how the government treats uh, women. Kay says, I'm sure you do get uh, way more than me. And yes, women always get screwed. He says, I'm okay for now, but let's see what happens when I get home. Okay, in a day or two, thanks. It might be okay when you get home, Stephen, but uh, most likely that hospital bill is going to be something. Steve Wolbrand says, we're here for you, brother. Hoping for the best for you, buddy. My thoughts are with you. Havel says, uh, um, I never knew that SSK is sexist. Uh, Steve DeVore says, uh, can anyone give me a recommendation on a good, comfortable mattress? But not by brand name. I'd say take a look at the kind of thing Costco is selling. Uh, they may have some some foam mattresses, which are very thick and very comfortable. Steve Wolfman says, Avomano, it's not. Kay says, it sure is. Women always work low-paying jobs, take time off to have children, take care of family members when they get sick, so we are screwed. Avril says, I read that if Biden doesn't win Ohio and Florida, uh, he will lose. I don't think that's true. Okay, first of all, he could lose in Ohio and lose in Florida and win okay, in Texas. Okay, and assuming he wins in California and New York, you know, and the other usual places, that would be all okay, that he would need. But also there are many other states that are definitely turning his way or have already turned his way, Pennsylvania, um, Iowa, Wisconsin, okay, Michigan. Uh, he's winning in the north central states. He's winning on what used to be known as the blue wall. He's winning all through New England. And he's winning in Virginia. He has a chance in North Carolina, a really good chance in North Carolina. He's ahead now, okay, in North Carolina. He's ahead in many, many of the swing states. 
He's ahead, I think, by two points in Florida and one point. Okay, in Ohio, those are still close. But Trump's been losing support uh, since he got the uh, COVID. He keeps on losing support. That's the way things are looking now. You know, it remains to be seen. There is still uh, three weeks left. So, uh, and Kay says, yes, it sure is, Steve. Kay says other states are in play, too. Arvel says, uh, um, um, SS doesn't go by that. And Steve says that that magic foam shit is pretty good. Yeah, it is pretty good. Yeah, we have one of those mattresses we've been using for years and years now. Still comfortable. I scrolled too fast. <laughs> ah. K says, no, it sure doesn't. And K says, I would get only 300 a month if it went uh, only by my wages. I get the rest uh, from my ex, okay, of 11 years. Avril says, I'm still wondering why Millie, uh, what he's going to do when Cuckoo Agolf tries his coup. Well, okay, it all depends on what he does for his coup. If he comes in with the arm guys and tries a coup on that basis, well, uh, you know, then maybe Milley is going to defend the Constitution. But if he tries uh, the kind of coup that Bush tried in uh, 2000, and he relies on the Supreme Court, again, uh, taking things away from the states, uh, then probably Milley would view that as somehow constitutional because the Supreme Court is involved. And maybe he would not come in or feel obligated to come in with any troops. Steve, um, 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 Stephen Wolfbrand said, well, this should be interesting. And Kay Clark Ryan said, I had three kids and took care of my partner in life, Scott, while he was sick and dying from cancer. Um, too, along with helping to care for my dad while he was dying of cancer, too. Avril says, uh, since when does SS go by your income? Uh, well, uh, it has to go by income, because that's the only way to explain why my Social Security is so much higher than mine's. Jay says, always has. Rob says, that's why Democrats suck. Avril says, so Mitch took her as a joke. He took uh, the whole idea of uh, 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 the whole idea of people needing relief from COVID, uh, further relief from COVID, okay, as a joke. He simply laughed it off. He's so confident that people in Kentucky okay, are going to support him. I think Emmy McGrath should have been running her whole campaign on how Mitch has been reacting to people during this crisis and his inability to marshal the Republicans to get them to vote for the relief of the people need. She should have been running on that for months now. And she should have had her speech, her attack speeches honed for this debate. She did. She was, when she got to the critical part, she was okay in some of the clips I saw. She was more straightforward okay, in some of those. But when it came to going after Mitch on COVID uh, relief, I'm telling you, it's like uh, uh, when he started laughing, I mean, it was like it sort of threw her off and she started melting down. I mean, she was ineffectual. I mean, you can't believe she was a Marine uh, flyer. I think she was a Marine flyer, wasn't she? I mean, you can't believe that she had those kind of guts. 
Rob said, um, but, um, do you think enthusiasm is going to be a factor? Trump sure has a lot of people and virtually nobody showed up when Biden and uh, Kamala showed up um, in um, Arizona. Yes, I think enthusiasm okay, is going to be a factor, but there's a lot of anti-Trump enthusiasm that's causing people all over the country to show up at the polls for early voting. Early voting is is in multiples of what it's been, okay, in past elections. And there are still weeks to go of early voting. Um, people are trying to avoid vote by mail, and they're trying to avoid election day. And there's great enthusiasm for that kind of avoidance and casting your vote to get out uh, Trump. Because I think many, many people realize that Trump has endangered their lives. Steve Wolfman said, Doc and Bonnie might be related to Keith Richards. They will live forever. <laughs> I don't think so, Steve. Alvaro says, is that the bodacious Bonnie sashaying in the background? And Alvaro says, hi, Bonnie. How are you? Hi. Bonnie says, hi. Deborah says, I think in the past, the scenario you described about the Gush -Bor Gore Bush race, how it could go if this happens now. I don't think Americans will show up to protest like depicted in 1984. The people will be too busy staring at their screens. No, nah, people were addicted to television, uh, you know, in the year 2000 also. And uh, they were ready to get off their duffs. And according to, uh, to Jane McAlevey, they could easily have been mobilized. Old, retired Jewish people living in Florida were ready to go into the streets with their walkers. Alvaro Mano says, that's because Biden supporters aren't as anxious to get uh, the COVID as Trump supporters. You know, the Trump supporters are looking to get kisses from Trump. Kay says, I can't show up to protest anymore like I did was uh, when I was young, okay, although I wish I could. Same here, Kay. Alvaro says, Rent is too damn high equals homelessness. K says homelessness okay, is an inequality problem and always has been. Yes, it has been. Steve Wolfman says, uh, but, uh, but Benjamin Franklin was busy bonking French uh, whores. Uh, but, well, that's what I like about him. My understanding, he was busy bonking French uh, but, uh, but, uh, but French ladies from the nobility. That's what he was doing. Having a lot of extramarital affairs. I don't mean it was extramarital for him. Extramarital for them. He was quite a ladies man. He was reportedly very worldly and very charming. And he literally charmed the pants off them. <laughs> Avril says, why are the airlines getting more money? They're already filthy rich. They're stockholders. Well, because we want to keep them in business, and we don't understand that the way to keep them in business is just to buy them. Just buy them and have the government run air travel. That's the best way to do it. Then we won't always be bailing them out. Avril says, I'm talking about SCOTUS stopping the census headcount as Trump uh, requested in the news today. Yeah, that could happen. That could happen. But they won't stop the head count with a 4-4 decision. That's why they need Amy Coney Barrett. Avril says, oh, Zappa is deep. deep. Kay says, um, I loved Zappa. Albert says, I see his memes, and he says some golden verbs. Kay says, should have seen him live, um, Avro. He was great. Albert says, I can't sleep on foam mattresses or soft mattresses. Hurts my back like hell. Get firm oh, the foam mattresses uh, can be very firm. Um, our mattress is pretty firm. It's not soft. 
Avril says, 30,000 Cubans to the car caravan for Agov uh, 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 in Miami. I was livid. Kay says, my back misses my old waterbed with baffles and heater. She says, that was the only bed I slept well in. What are Paula Jean's odds? I don't know. I haven't seen polling from that state. I'm just judging from uh, the 2018 election when she gave Joe Manchin a run for his money, and he's much more popular than, uh, but what's her name? Uh, Shelley Moore Capito. Avril says, uh, um, baffled about what uh, the baffles are. Steve DeVore says, I miss my waterbed too. Steve Wilkman said, are those waterbeds uh, wonderful. Kay says, they make a waterbed not so soft. They're built into the mattress. Avril Mano says, sounds perfect. Kay says, had to leave mine behind when I lost my home in Southeast North Carolina. Stephen DeVore says, um, uh, his was a low wave, it was solid, yet you sunk in all the right places. That was, that's nice. Steve Wolperin says, the water beds weren't that great for sex. I kept hitting bottom. <laughs> Kay says, yours had baffles too, Stephen DeVore. And Avril Mano says, and Trump is selling those kisses at his rallies to suburbanite women who he said, I saved your neighborhoods. I don't think there are many suburbanite women showing up at this point to kiss uh, uh, DT. Steve says, it was very expensive bed originally. The person who sold it to me was much too impatient to set it up um, properly. I loved it, but didn't want to move it cross country, half full of water. Aramon says, "There you go, Steve. Get a water bed then." <laughs> Steve says, "But I never hit the bottom." <laughs> okay, guys, I've reached the end. I'll be on tomorrow with things that are equally interesting. Thank you for hanging around. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. And uh, look up my short takes and watch my short takes. If I don't get too many people uh, taking advantage of the short takes, I might stop the short takes. I don't know. I don't want to do short takes if nobody's going to watch them. Rob says, okay, Yoda, I got to get going. It was good to be able to watch a live stream for a longer period of time. Thanks, Rob. It was good to have you around. Take care. Actually, we've got to get going, too. So I'm going to end the broadcast. Okay, Dolores says, thank you and good night, all. Thank you, Dolores. Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for all of the volunteer work that you've been doing for me over a period of time. You are greatly appreciated. Steve DeVore says, sweet dreams. Kay says, thank you all for another great uh, discussion. I love you all. We love you too, Kay. Take care. <laughs>